I would like to first make a few brief observations uh, regarding the 2024 financial year and also the company outlook, and they will be brief. Um, I'll then hand over to Gary, our CEO, who will update you on the progress of our uh, business in the current period. Um, a copy of uh, the address and Gary's presentation uh, will be lodged on the ASX and be published in the investor section of the company's office. Uh, for those of you who are able to attend in person today, we are looking forward also to have um, a more informal discussion after this um, the, the formal meeting. And for those shareholders who are joining us online, we'd like to thank you for attending uh, virtually. Um, in terms of uh, 2024, a couple of observations as a new chair. Um, Sequoia demonstrated a fairly high degree of resilience uh, and growth despite a fairly challenging economic backdrop. Um, what was achieved during the year was a sale of Morrison's, 80% uh, of Morrison's, and then we also streamlined the organisation, reduced it essentially to two profitable divisions, increased the operating margin, um, and divested of some non-core assets and continued with the restructuring. Um, we also had a slightly disruptive period uh, in the second half of this year around um, concerns, which resulted in a EGM process undertaken. What came out of that was notwithstanding the disruption, we were able to continue and produce a significantly improved result. Post that, the board now is undertaking a strategic review. We've completed the first part of that review um, and then are now in the planning stage as we look into the next couple of years and develop a strategy for the uh, strong profitable direction for the company going forward. Um, we are excited about the prospects. The Sequoia itself is in a strong position and we're looking forward to developing that strategic plan over the coming months. Um, I'm open to questions on those after Gary has uh, given his presentation. Um, I'll hand over to Gary now um, to go through your presentation, Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Mike for his um, his efforts in a short period of time since our disruption, and also thank Kevin and and Charles for their support of me and the company um, during that transition period. It has been a challenging year, and and we've come out the back of it very well. Um, I just want to touch on firstly, we're obviously not putting the slides up on the screen, but I'll 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 talk to my presentation. Um, the rev revenue for 2024 was 124 million, and we generated 8.7 million dollars of operating profit, um, which was an 88 percent increase on the previous corresponding period. Um, the the current net cash position at 30th of June was 16.8 million, and the dividend, the normal dividend that we pay to shareholders, was 4.5 cents per share. We actually did distribute seven cents per share in total. But the normalised dividend, I think, is the important number to look at, and that was 4.5 cents per share. And, and it is important for us to um, be a company that's looking to um, generate growth, but it's also a company that we actually are looking to generate um, fully frank dividend yield for, for investors. The, the company, as Mike pointed out, has undergone a streamlining process and a review process. And, you know, what, some of the points that the agitators um, at the... Um, EGM throughout the year discussed was that they thought we should streamline the business and we and we were in agreement with that and we have um, we we were already under you know already begun a process um, and you know we we have done part way through that process we engaged a, a consultant who helped us have a look where we were um, and and gave us some very good strategic advice and and we're we're, we're moving through that process but the the, the important part of 2024 and as we move forward is we now have two very distinct operating divisions, and that is a legal and administration services um, division and a licensee and advisor services division. And each of those two divisions are making 
um, significant contribution to the um, the total earnings and both have very, very exciting um, organic and non-organic opportunities um, looking forward. And we'll look to focus on a particular parts of each of those businesses as, as we formulate the strategic review um, at the next stage. Um, I might, might just talk to the legal administration services business because it, it's a bit of a hidden gem um, that shareholders might not necessarily appreciate um, Sequoia as. I think um, in the past, Sequoia has been known for its licensee services business um, and the Interprac business primarily. Um, yet we've been building this legal and administration services business now for um, several years. Um, and the key to this software as a service business in some sense um, has been getting to a scale where we start to um, see that particular investment generate strong cash flow and um, strong operating earnings from um, that scale. Um, the revenue in 2023 was 7.3 million and the revenue in 2024 that we've just gone past was 9.3 million. So revenue grew by 1.6 million, which is reasonable. But I think more importantly, as, as the numbers look, is that the EBITDA grew from 2.2 to 4.2 million which is actually a greater increase than the revenue itself. Um, and that's because once you get to scale in these types of businesses, um, the revenue on top of, of your break-even cost basically all goes to the um, to the EBITDA. We think that once you get to scale, 75 to 80 cents in the dollar is going to um, EBITDA. And, and we now do have scale. We're at about 12% market share. Um, there's two major providers in this particular section that are slightly bigger, but it's very much a cottage industry. And this business, um, we've invested significant dollars in technology over time. In the last six months, we've invested some more, and we're really scaling this particular business up to do to do more um, services and 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 grow um, at, at a, a good double digit number um, on the revenue side. And as I pointed out, the EBITDA line probably increases further um, for, further from that. Um, on, on the licensee and advisor services um, business, this, this is a much larger revenue business and, and, and one we're well known for. Um, the market um, itself um, rates the Interprac business very, very highly uh, and the salaried advice businesses and the other business that we have in this division um, are investments that we're making for growth and, and they're coming through and, and you're seeing that um, hit, hit the, um, the line. So, EBITDA went from 4.4 million to 8.4 million before your head office cost. So it's, it's a good business. It's a business that's um, in a tight market. The number of advisors in the industry have continued to fall throughout 2024. Um, however, the Sequoia and the Interprac um, position was that we didn't see um, our advisors fall. In fact, our advisors went against the trend. The number of advisors, we were only one of three licenses in Australia to actually have growth. Um, which is very positive and the quality of the underlying practices within the network is very high and we're seeing um, much more demand than there is supply in respect to the advisor channel. So we, we um, as part of the strategic review, we're looking at, at that particular business and how we pivot to um, owning more of that channel in respect to salaried advice and growing our broking arm and growing our family office business and growing our corporate finance area. So it's an exciting business. It's a lower margin business but it, it creates scale for so many other things and um, and putting the parts together, I think makes an, an awful lot of sense. The, the, the key strategic initiatives that we've defined in, in, in some of the reports that um, Maureen, who was here today, a consultant assisted us with um, and, and the board has been discussing um, over time is that we want to, and we've been saying this for quite some time, is we want to divest non-core businesses and, and streamline existing operations. In the half year um, that we're currently in, we've divested another three small businesses. Um, they weren't scale. And we've also um, reduced um, headcount in some of the businesses that we weren't getting the return on investment that we expected. So the media business, for example, has undergone a very major um, review. And in December 1, you'll see um, the benefits of that. You'll see new Share Cafe and Financial News Network content coming out. 
we're investing in AI, we're investing in technology, and that business is looking forward to some real growth and stop, it, stop losing money and, and, and begin making money. And I think it makes a, a significant contribution to the business. We did sell two business units and we've reduced staff in that business from around 12 to four um, in this half year. That does come at a cost with retrenchment costs and all those sorts of things, but looking forward, it's extremely positive. Um, we will continue to invest in technology and we have done that in this half. We're investing about $2 million currently in technology um, across the business. Unlike many businesses, we're not capitalizing any of that. We're expensing to the to the bottom line in all cases. So that, that does make your earnings a little bit lumpy, but we think we want transparent accounts and we're definitely looking to invest more in technology. The industry, particularly in the advice sector, um, is an aging population and the opportunity for people to get advice at a reasonable cost is difficult um, with an aging population of the actual end advisor. So the future um, is definitely in technology and enabling advisors to reduce the cost of provision of advice. And we're looking to assist our network um, by investing in technology to make the cost of advice for Australians a lot lower and the margin on those businesses a lot higher. Um, as a result of that investment. So we, we think that investment over time will will pay dividends and we're, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, in, in the six months that, that we're currently in, we've also restructured the Sequoia Specialist Investment Division. We're now outsourcing more of our product um, that we're looking to market to the public. We've reduced costs, um, short-term um, hit to, to, the, to the, you know, when you reduce the staff headcount, but a long-term gain. And, and I think that's um, exciting. And I think that will show through in the, particularly in the second half earnings and, and much more longer term. One, one of the things the board is fully aware of that we're a very small company, um, a market cap of, of 40 odd, 50 odd million dollars. That that's that that's too small to be um, the, the type of provider we want to be. So we're looking to invest and look for long-term earnings growth. And we're committed to both organic and inorganic growth to, to meet those targets. We, we definitely want to increase our market share in the licensee services. We're currently at around 360 advisors um, of about a pool of about 10,000 available advisors. Um, the statistics show that there's 15,000 advisors out there, but about 5,000 of those advisors are not suitable for our type of um, licensee. They might give general advice or they might be limited to just doing accounting type transactions and not your traditional financial planner. So your traditional financial planner is down to actually 10,000 advisors to support a community that's um, hungry for advice as, as um, transition of wealth between families takes place and the baby boomers begin to move to retirement. So the demand is extremely significant and we're um, looking to capture, move from, you know, move to about 5% market share of those you license over time. And we expect that to happen mostly organically. Um, we definitely want to increase the market share in that legal and admin business. So as you can see, the margins are extremely high and we're, we're keen to invest in that particular sector, particularly in technology, more marketing direct to public and, and also support the 1,200 accountants that currently use us and move that to a much larger number of accountants. There's approximately 10,000 accountancy practices in Australia that can use that particular business. We've got as I said, 1,200, so about 12% market share. We definitely want to increase that. Um, and, and the positive thing about the Sequoia business model is an accountant practice is a very key core client for us in so many other areas. So if we can touch into accountancy practices, the demand for uh, financial services um, in more than just setting up documents and trust is, is actually very significant. Um, I also might want just to touch on our balance sheet. Um, we, we, it's a very strong balance sheet. The company has, you know, as I mentioned before, we've been um, keen to look at um, inorganic opportunities as well as organic opportunities. Um, and the company has actually invested quite strongly and heavily in buying its own shares back because we believe when you're looking at investments to make, um, we have felt that our own shares are um, a very good investment. So we've actually aggressively um, um, look to buy back shares. We'll continue to do that strategy um, over time. Um, the top 20 shareholders um, of the 124 million shares hold 56% of the stock, um, which is a high number. 
Um, the number of shareholders has actually increased, however, to 699 shareholders. So we've got a very wide um, shareholder base, but we're actually quite keen to um, continue over time, um, consider um, the buyback strategy that we've implemented over the last 12 months. The, the franking credit balance also is important to note because we do want to distribute franking credit. We do want to um, distribute dividends. There was some concern a little while back that um, the government might change franking. So we were a bit more aggressive on our, our dividend strategy and paid a few specials. Um, but the franking credit balance at 30th of June was $19.3 million. So that's a very high franking credit balance. Um, and we have um, $15.3 million uh, of cash and listed shares. So the company's in a very strong position to distribute some of that that those franking credits and we'll continue to look for growth and dividend um, investments. On, on the balance sheet, in addition to that 15.3 million cash and listed shares, we've got investments in um, URI and, and James is here today. So thanks, James. And also we still own 20% of Morrison's and on our balance sheet, we have approximately $10.7 million accredited to those two investments. So cash and investments in total is about $25 million of our $44 million market cap. So the actually underlying um, enterprise value of the business is less than $20 million, which we need to change. And um, I might end there, um, open some questions after I yeah, pass back to Mike, you, and um, thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, I'll go to Sally first. Sally, have we any questions online? Great, thank you. Well, then questions to shareholders attending today on any of the matters raised by myself or the CEO. Peter. Hi, Gary. Um, you touched on the fact that you've got guidance, you haven't. Um, are you going to give guidance? Um, the share price has been a disaster over the last six months. Yeah. We know there's been some <clears throat> indiscriminate of the data with vindictive selling, and that's probably coming to an end. Yeah. So the stocks are everyone, the sheep stocks on the board, and you see something. So guidance in terms of earnings, but that's what's going to be the share price and obviously guidance in terms of earnings. Yeah, um, I might answer the first part of that. We, we, as a board, decided that we wouldn't be giving guidance into the future. I think you sometimes can get tripped up on, on that a little bit. Um, but what we have indicated is our expectations is that the second half will be stronger than the first half, given the broader economic backdrop and the performance of the capital markets and the sort of impact that the higher interest rate environment has had in the first half. Um, and if we go into the second half, there's a number of tailwinds that are kicking in for the um, for Sequoia, one being obviously the cost reduction that we've implemented, the restructuring of the, the divisions or some of the divisions. And then we would expect possibly a, a better second half in the capital markets. Um, that's about as good a guidance that you'll get from us, I think, Peter, at this stage. I might, um, I might just and, add, and a little, add I just add a fraction to that. I think we're we're very well aware of the ASX rules in respect to um, alterations to guidance and expectations. We're not making any statement whatsoever in respect to the first half of any deterioration of earnings in respect to what ASX rules would require us to. Yep. Um, the question regarding um, dividends or buybacks, um, uh, we acknowledge that obviously the share price has been under some pressure and you quite rightly pointed out um, there's been a couple of people that have just been sitting on. Um, I think importantly here is that the, the review process and subsequent strategic plan will be overlaid with uh, sort of capital management policy, which will impact on how we apply uh, our cash, whether it's returning it to shareholders or growing the company. There's always a fine balance between the two and also maintaining a reasonably robust balance sheet. So again, I'm not giving you a direct answer other than allowing the, and, and highlighting as I had previously, if you're, if you're looking at a company that's $50 million as a income yielding company, then we're probably not at, we're looking for growth 
and therefore we have to invest back in the company to achieve that. Gary, do you want to add anything to that? No, no, I, th I think that's right. I think um, I've talked about my name as being what represents Sequoia. So growth at a reasonable yield, um, being Gary, is um, is what we want to be. So we want to grow and we want a reasonable yield. We've got franking credits, so we should use them in an appropriate manner. Um, but we want to grow. We don't want to stay at this market cap. We want to invest and make acquisitions and invest in the business to grow our revenue and our EBITDA number. But that's the most important factor. Can I ask one more question, Mike? Yes. Um, 6%, 5% revenue is the gap on the balance sheet. Is that that's got me for probably 12 months. The new price is proven reasonably attractive. But are you going to hang on to it? What's, what's, what's the whole point of owning that last? Um, it, was your time, so. it, it was before my time. Um, all these things are sort of being reviewed at the moment and will form part of the strategic plan going forward. Um, I've got a personal view, which I'm not necessarily going to share at this, at this juncture. But again, what we're looking at doing ultimately is developing a, a more simplistic structure with strong growth um, businesses that we can add to um, and expand on with an overlay of technology and capability. Um, so again, does that form part of that strategy? I think you might know the answer to that. Yep. Yes. Uh, thank you, thanks. I'm a, a shareholder. Uh, Welcome. Thank comments. you very much for uh, your support. Uh, but, uh, two of the comments there, question to get. First is, uh, I actually looked last year, I think, carbon on um, which I'll ignore uh, for this purpose. But Cyril Morrison, I think, did a really good job of a really good price for what. And congratulations on that. I know it's ancient history and what it seems, but it'll continue. Um, the second thing is, you know, uh, I understand that the so the special came out with, with great credit, so I think that was really good. And I would encourage all the boards I this in to consider that you know breaking credits are an interest free loan to the government on behalf of shareholders. <laughs> and the longer the government holds those interest free loans, um, the more deterioration to the shareholders, which I know it's a cash payment that needs to come with it. Um, but uh, you know, build the BRP base up to the top twenty million. Know, perhaps there is a way just to, to recycle you know, capital. Yeah. Just like that was common. Um, what I am interested in is this financial plan is just a super tough business in the next, well, the last 10 years has been super tough. The next years are going to be tough. But it's hard to get from people to get advice. The compliance obligations are absurdly, you know, but we're lucky like we've got a few dollars to sell off to, to sort of buy a product. That required, you know, then you wanted to put two hundred dollars a month in the budget twenty or something. That was five thousand eight hundred dollars to get a financial plan for a uni student. You had to put two hundred dollars a month that was working for not for the priest working uh, in. And the, the idea that you can't buy what's increasing some of the low risk sort of you know, investment of a twenty year old, but if no one would see it, no one would ever have to do that. See it. But I was interested, Gary, you know, how, how, what are the key things we should be looking for in terms of what the company is doing for us? You know, that, that growth of business, there should be 20,000 potential plans of advice out there. There's 10,000 that can't get advice, it's super expensive. Five strategy is absurd. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the catalyst to break that model to really open it up? It's a terrific question. Um... And it's it's an industry challenge. Um, there's there's no doubt about it. the The age of the current advisor network across Australia is too old, um, like me. Um, and the the next evolution of the advisors are coming through what they call a professional year at the moment within practices. We've we've currently got thirty um, advisors doing professional years, but it's an expensive proposition so in the first three months of a professional year that employer can almost do nothing um, sit and make coffee and maybe sit in a meeting and then over time over that 12-month period they get, begin to get some knowledge 
and then they can move to becoming authorised. However, the practice that's employing them is still charging that $5,000 per head for advice. And the capacity of an advisor is approximately 150 to 200 clients per advisor. So a quality practice is going to have 750,000 to a million dollars of revenue. They make very good margin. They make a 30 to 40% margin on that revenue. The licensee holder like Interprac, um, it's a very tight business. You, you know, you're renting a license out to those parties and your margin is quite tight. So the future for us potentially is to own the advisor and to make more investments in those advisors. As then we do that, we can have a premium offering where we can actually start to employ more salaried employees, invest in technology so they can provide lower cost solutions to Australia. Um, and that that can be part in, in potentially robo-advice, which was a really buzzword three years ago. Um, but there, there is there is ways to create lower cost advice if you own the advice. Um, and we're certainly open to, we've got three or four channels at the moment where we we are, do have salaried advice businesses. We've got a balance sheet that's reasonable in respect to cash to acquire equity into more of our advisors, but also third party advisors. And that's probably the solution, but it's a slow burn. Um, and finding so that- You don't think cats the yeah, it's hard work and it's a grind, but that's, that's it from my point of view. We, we have 360 advisors with 15 odd billion in the network. The, the moat um, is high. You know, the, the opportunity for someone else to come along and create that is very difficult. We're getting no value whatsoever for that moat that we actually have within Sequoia. And that that is a, a grind, but it's actually an opportunity that market is not um, currently seeing. Um, it will see it if we do it. If we don't, it's um, useless. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Great. I was just going to make a comment on that too, Mike. We've been discussing this. And yeah. board this very issue, you know, with the you know, um, there is talk, you us to the assistant treasurer who covered Stephen Jones and covered out and said, you know, we're going to reduce all of the and then this and that. Well, until that happens, we've got to fight with neighbors that can make that happen. Obviously, the technology is part of that. But there was an interesting article which Mike said, I would read the other day with the, um, the medium advice model, which is what a lot of people are. Are looking for now, they don't want to pay five thousand dollars. So, how do, you, how do you find that right range? I think the first company that finds the answer that they have to solve that question about how do you get a medium advice model uh, at a reasonable price using technology? They're the licensee that are really going to be very. I might, I might continue on. Cameron Bott is in the room, a good friend of mine, but Cameron was a, a foundation. Uh, shareholder of Steadfast. So Steadfast was a business in a uh, you know, way, way back that used to be a license, a rent, rent the license. And they they pivoted to buying equity in the practices. Um, that changed their world. So the opportunity for general insurance emerged from exactly that same moat that I'm suggesting we have. Um, that Insignia has, uh, has recognised, that Centrepoint has recognised, that Counters recognised. It's a slow burn. But it's it's there. 